to the ninth meeting of 2014 of the Public Audit Committee. Uh, can I ask members, uh, witnesses and others to make sure that all electronic devices are switched to flight mode so that uh, they don't interfere with uh, the, the recording equipment. Um, we have apologies this morning from Tavi Scott. Uh, Liam MacArthur will be attending the meeting uh, at some point. Um, can item one in the agenda, can we agree to take uh, item three in private? Thank you. Um, item two in our agenda, um, our, we have a section 23 report, uh, reshaping care for older people. Uh, and before us uh, today as witnesses, uh, we have Paul Gray, who's the Director General of Health and Social Care and also the Chief Executive of NHS Scotland, trying to get in all that into a small business card, Paul. Gillian uh, Bartley, who's the head of unit uh, of the Integration and Reshaping Care, Fiona Hodgkiss, principal researcher, uh, the Health Analytical Services of the Scottish Government. Welcome. Uh, we also, um, from the Joint Improvement Team, have Dr Anne Henry, um, who's the clinical lead of integrated care, Pete Knight, programme lead for partnership information, <coughs> and Jerry Power, the national lead for co-production and community capacity. Uh, so again, uh, welcome. I believe that Paul, yourself and Dr Henry would like to make uh, an opening contribution. Thank you very much, convener. Um, uh, Dr Henry will just follow directly on from me. I'm pleased to be invited to the committee um, to uh, respond on the Reshaping Care for Older People programme report. We have already said that we accept the recommendations contained in the report, although we hope uh, today to be able to set out where we are already making good progress against these on what is um, a 10-year programme. There is no doubt that services are under pressure and we are working hard to find better ways of delivering and finding savings where possible, but we do believe there are different ways of achieving high quality outcomes through new, more sustainable ways of delivering services which will meet the needs of older people. There is generally a positive consensus about the need to reshape care for older people and indeed to integrate health and social care to meet both current and future demands and Parliament has uh, passed legislation to that end. There, are, there is, I think, agreement that we need to avoid as far as possible expensive crisis interventions involving acute hospital care where we have evidence that a planned approach can ensure that someone is able to be cared for better uh, at home. We also need to ensure that where new accommodation is commissioned, it meets uh, conforms to current best practice. Um, and uh, I have been uh, out yesterday to see some accommodation that did conform to that practice, and I am happy to speak more about that in due course to help people to get the best quality of life. And to help people also to take control of and manage their own conditions without having to be constantly dependent on repeat visits to um, health and other facilities and our self-directed support programme, which local authorities are implementing, is an important component of that. Um, we also would like to be able to help the committee, if it considers it appropriate, um, on important national strategies. For example, the dementia strategy was, was not touched upon in any detail in Audit Scotland's consideration, and we believe that forms an important component of what we do, and there's been substantial progress there. And I did want to make the point that our focus on outcomes and activity has been shaped by older people themselves, so there ought to be as much attention on the suite of core measures developed in consultation with older people as there is uh, uh, on uh, the commitments which are set out in uh, Exhibit 11 of the report. Um, the approach has moved on since the reshaping care for older people commitments were set, and while they remain useful, um, we are moving to a whole system approach and have a coherent framework for this. Uh, I am happy also to speak a, a little, if the, com the committee finds it helpful, on how the change fund monies were spent and the joint improvement team report provides some detail on that and colleagues there can uh, assist uh, me with that. We did ask partnerships to submit the reshaping care for older people plans and they were subject to scrutiny and we assured ourselves about the governance arrangements. And I think it was also important that partners were directed to work with the third sector and uh, work with anticipatory care colleagues as part of that process. Audit Scotland, I think, helpfully acknowledged that the 10-year 
reshaping care for older people was a complex and transformational one. And I'd just like to invite, uh, before taking questions from the committee, my colleague Anne Henry to give a, a very brief mm -hmm. opening statement. Thank you. Good morning. Um, on behalf of the Joint Improvement Team, I'd like to thank the committee for inviting us to give oral evidence on the report on reshaping care published by the Auditor General for Scotland and Accounts Commission. The, the committee might find it helpful if I briefly describe the role that the Joint Improvement Team has. It's a strategic improvement partnership between Scottish Government, NHS in Scotland, the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities and the third independent and housing sectors. And the team itself is mainly drawn from people with experience in health, social care or housing sectors. And our main purpose is to provide critical support and challenge to local partnerships to help them deliver improved outcomes. We're working with all 32 of the local partnerships to implement the Reshaping Care for Older People programme and to use the Change Fund to develop and to test new models of working, new models of care and support that are based on greater collaboration and integrated working. We encourage spread of good practice through our national learning events, through sharing case studies, and also undertaking specific benchmarking activities. Scaling up these improvements to deliver sustainable change is a longer term ambition that's being addressed primarily through our national development programme for joint strategic commissioning and integrated resourcing and, and I'm sure we're, we'll explore that this morning. On behalf of the national partners we have published a series of progress reports on reshaping care since the inception of the change fund and many of the examples in our published report in November of last year have in fact spread beyond those tests of change to now being embedded in practice. And we're seeing evidence of partnerships beginning to join up these interventions to sort of amplify their impact and to provide more comprehensive and coherent and coordinated services in a locality to support older people to remain at home. And to tailor our improvement support to the areas that are most in need of that support, we keep sighted on various trend data that are available nationally. For example, we track on a monthly basis the performance by all partnerships against this heat emergency bed days target, which is the sentinel measure for, for reshaping care for older people. And we'd be very happy to explore some of that activity further in response to the committee's questions this morning. Um, Mr Gray, you referred to uh, Exhibit 11 in the report. <coughs> Can I ask you, uh, just for some clarification, Commitment 7, which says we will ensure older people are not admitted directly to long-term institutional care from an acute hospital. What happens when an older person uh, is in an acute hospital and who is not capable of returning home? Where do they go? I think, well, Convener, first of all, just to be completely transparent with the committee, I think there are, there are still instances of older people being admitted directly to um, long-term institutional care uh, and indeed I was speaking to uh, colleagues in the social work department at uh, South Lanarkshire Council about that yesterday um, because I think we share the concerns around that. I think what we're trying to prevent here is uh, any sense of an automatic move from uh, acute long-term acute institutional care uh, sorry, to, into long-term acute, uh, long-term institutional care from acute settings where um, there, are other, there are often many other alternatives including step-down care um, or equipment and adaptations in people's homes um, or a care package or a combination of these features which can help. Um, Dr Henry will be able to say in a moment, and I'll, I'll give her the prompt that I'm going to ask her, what we're doing to head in that direction. I think the, the, the commitment that we've made uh, is one that's going to be hard to keep in every single case, and I, I'm not going to try and back away from, from saying that. 
think what you've said is entirely reasonable. Um, it's sensible, and I, I, I think it's absolutely the right thing to do. You know, where at all possible, um, seek to look for, for alternatives. But what I just cannot understand, however, is just how specific that commitment is. You know, if, what, why is it not couched in the language that, that, that you've described that, you know, we would seek to avoid um, admitting older people directly from long-term institutional care to an, uh, from an acute hospital, you know, unless there are no other alternatives? But, but that's not what it says. You know, like, what, what you've said is, as I said, is, is eminently sensible. But the commitment is actually very clear. We will ensure that they are not admitted directly to long-term institutional <coughs> care. Why say that when you know the practicalities are different? And uh, were I to write this commitment today, I think I would in insert some qualifying words in it, convener. But why was it then put down like that? You know, like, because we could say that about any report. Yeah. Well, 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 let's go back and rewrite reports. But, you know, presumably the great, the good uh, and the intelligent all sat down and, you know, came up with a, a series of commitments and this was thought about very carefully and, and yet, you know, you're saying uh, very directly today that that's really not what, what you're committing to and, and, it, and it shouldn't be written like that. And I think the other point I would make before I bring Dr Henry in is that it is, of course, a 10-year programme and it would still be an ambition if we could, by the end of this 10-year programme, to be in a position where we weren't doing that. But I do think, um, convener, that... that that would mean that there would have to be a, a set of alternatives available which are not yet available um, and may be within the, in, in the scope of the 10-year the, the, the programme that we have in hand. But, but whether it's a 10, 20 or 30-year programme, um, you, you're still suggesting that there is an aspiration that that would happen, and yet we know that there will be people who are not capable <coughs> of living on their own. And the logic of what you say would suggest that no one should be in long-term institutional care. But if, but if, if we're going to have long-term institutional care, then why would it not be available for older people who are no longer, um, or should no longer be in an acute hospital? If, for example, there was an assessment facility through which that older person could go, um, from the acute hospital and into long-term institutional care, that might be a better outcome for that individual. I think one of the issues we face is that assessing older people for their care requirements in acute wards is not at always the best setting for that, and that's what we're, that's what we're trying to avoid. So if there were step-down facilities or assessment facilities, that would be a better way of doing this, and in the course of this 10-year programme, we may be able to achieve it. I'm simply trying, and you're acknowledging, uh, for which I'm grateful, convener, I'm seeking to say to the committee that we're not at that point today. No, 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 I accept that. I'm, I'm, I'm just still puzzled about this commitment, because even your suggestion of some, for, for some people, um, of not doing the assessment in the acute hospital and prob possibly having a step-down facility is, is, is hugely problematic for an older person. You know, I, I, I went through both my mother and, and, and father, God rest them both, the, you know, where they were in hospital for, for some significant uh, period. And, and the thought of putting them, taking them from one institution into a second institution merely to have an assessment to go to a third institution is, is physically, mentally and emotionally uh, damaging. And, uh, you know, if, if we truly believe that we're seeking to minimise the pressure on an older person who needs care, and, we've accept, you know, and we accept that they need care, then why don't we get the facilities into the hospital to do the assessment properly rather than uprooting them? And, and sometimes they're in a situation where they can't understand why they're, they're in a particular environment. It takes them time to settle in to a new environment. And no sooner are they in this new environment for assessment than they're on their way again. 
it, it's a surefire way to shorten a person's life rather than putting in the, the, the care that, that they need. And m m my criticism here is, is, is not one about failure, because I know this is all about aspirations. And, and I just cannot understand the logic of, of both of what is written here and why you've, you've written it, but, and you've already said that it probably shouldn't be written like that, so why do that in the first place? But also I, I, I question the logic of what you say about taking them into intermediate settings if we accept that there is a need for long-term care. Sorry, Dr Henry, do you want to come in on that? Sure. Um, as, as, as Paul has, has stated, that, the, um, that, is a ten, that is part of the 10-year the commitment, the, the ambition. Um, and it's also in response to the engagement with older people and with the clinical profession that a hospital setting is not the right setting, the best setting to make a life-changing decision about giving up home and moving into long-term care. And it's not about assessment, it's also about assessment and an opportunity for enablement and recovery of confidence and independence. Often in admission to hospitals at a time where there's been a crisis, not just in the individual's health, but often a crisis of confidence of the carers as well. So an opportunity to get some time and space to recover that confidence and independence and to look at the possibilities is, is what this commitment's about. It's not about, in any sense, depriving the right of somebody to have institutional care if that's the right outcome for that individual. And, and I actually think in, in, in most cases, if we can achieve it, that's the right thing to do because I've, I've been through it in my own family sure. that um, the last place that you want them when they're elderly is to be long term in a hospital and you know the best place for them is to be at home with their family and their network of support around them so I, I accept all of that but really if you know we say that, that, that there is an assessment needing to be done then why, why not do that before they are moved? Why try to put them into an, yet another environment as a stepping stone to somewhere? If we know, and, and you're right, the best solution is for someone to be independent and mm -hmm. to be in their own home mm -hmm. and in the community. Mm -hmm. But if it's obvious to the medical professionals and to the social work professionals that that person is not going to cope in an independent environment, then why pile on more agony by taking them into another setting simply to do another assessment? Can, can I offer one statistic, uh, convener, if I may, which is that on an assessment done in 2009, 33%, one third of residents in residential care didn't actually need to be there. That, that's a different issue. That's looking at after the event. What we're talking here is about a commitment for future practice mm -hmm. and moving from hospital to, um, to institutional care. We're not talking about the ones who are in institutional care just now who, who, who shouldn't be there. We're talking about trying to influence a future practice. Indeed, and, but I'm, I'm explaining why the, um, one of the reasons for the genesis of this target. The other, the other point, which um, again I'll bring Dr Henry in on, but I, because I was discussing it yesterday, um, it is perhaps germane. What, what clinicians are advising me, um, and particularly nurses, is that when an older person is in an acute setting, as Dr Henry has said, that, that, that there can be a loss of confidence. That could have happened before they come in. And the ability to assess their uh, suitability for returning home is diminished by the fact that they themselves are in a, in a situation which is, to put it very simply, being in hospital and therefore you're unwell. So there is some evidence from the clinicians that, that uh, accepting entirely what you say about the uh, 
the bad effect of multiple moves, that nevertheless, assessing someone in, a, in, 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 in an environment which is more home-like gives you a better understanding of their likely suitability to return home. So that, that, that is in part what lies behind this. The fact that we recognise that there were a lot of people going from hospital into care settings when they didn't need to, and there was a better way to do this. I take your point about the multiple moves, and I, I, I accept it. I think it's, it's an important point. But I do think there was some genuine clinical evidence behind the decision here. Um, we've spoken at other uh, audit committees, and you were, you were fair with me then, about the difficulty of absolute targets. And you also accepted that the commitment will not be as it's written, that there in fact will be some older people who will uh, go directly from uh, an acute hospital to, to long-term institutional care, if that's appropriate. I'm a certain convener that, if, that in seven years' time or more, um, we may not get there 100 per cent, but I'd like to think we were getting there very close to it. But would it not be down to the needs of the individual rather than to some sort of bureaucratic uh, target? It should be, but I, I think the evidence we have is that the needs of the individual generally are better met by assessing them in a, a situation where the assessment is more robust and realistic. Right. Okay. Anyone else want to come in on that before I take Willie Coffey in and delay discharge? Lord Doris. Look, uh, you know, just really briefly, um, I, 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 Mr Gray, I hear what you're, you're, you're saying. Had that commitment said we will ensure older people are not inappropriately admitted directly to long term, then you could explain what you mean by inappropriate and flesh it out. I think that the, the target is a strong one and the convener has put on the record some of the caveats which I think you accept that normal practice would would account for. The only reason I'm, I'm coming to the supplementary convener is I thought you might have asked about the progress on it, which says national data is not available. So the obvious question for the audit committee to ask is, what are you doing to collect national data on this? Because we can't see whether things are getting better or worse unless there's national data collected. So just some information on that, convener. We have, as the, as the report says, uh, evidence that the rate of long-stay residents in, in care homes has decreased over time, but Dr Henry, do you want to say anything about how we might, that will come on automatically? In, it is information that local partnerships are collecting. So, for example, the um, submission from Glasgow is, um, on page 13 of the, the documents, describes Glasgow's experience of implementing this model, and their initial expectation was that up to maybe a quarter of people who have an opportunity to have that convalescence recovery space to, to, to get the confidence back might go home. In fact, they're finding already significantly more are able to return home or if they do require to move on to long-term care, they're moving on to long-term residential care rather than nursing care. So partnerships are tracking this at a local level. But we've got a series of health boards, we've got health and social care integration coming up. Uh, I've got a family member who was in hospital for about two weeks. Uh, we talked about his personal experience. A support package was put in place. They returned home. That would be one of the success stories. But that, how is that audited on a nationwide basis? I would, uh, could I even just that, rather than tie up the committee's time with this, could I ask you maybe to, to reflect on how we can audit the national picture and I understand with health and social care integration it might be this time next year before you can map out how best to audit that but is there an intention to have a national audit of what's happening locally so a future audit committee or a health committee can look at that? Thank you Mr Ross, thank you convener. Therefore, important for me to place on record that one of the things that this uh, report has, has made me thoughtful about is to check, uh, without making assumptions, have we got the right balance between national and local reporting. We don't want to diminish um, the way in which we have commissioned local partnerships by starting to make them turn into a bureaucratic reporting machine. But on the other hand, we want, I want to assure myself as the accountable officer that I have sufficient information 
at a national level to have assurance and th th thus to be able to provide assurance to committees such as this one. So that, that I'm certainly recording that it has certainly made me reflect on that point. I mean, I recognise um, the points made by Dr Henry and Mr Gray about the issue about whether a person is best assessed while they're still in the hospital or moved elsewhere. My own personal recollection of that in my uh, family's case was that it was, it was very helpful for it not to have been done in the hospital. I, I recall that my own family, you, you're, you're too stressed out by the experience of your family member being in hospital and hoping that that will come to a, a positive end and then to discuss a further destination or outcome after that. So I found that, probably in opposite to yourself, convener, more helpful in, in my circumstances that that wasn't done in hospital and it wasn't actually possible because every day you were going in there, you were hopeful that a better outcome would, would occur uh, to tell a different direction to take place. So I, I fully understand, I think, that the, the point that you made there and understand why that takes place and, and, and it works for some families. Um, Mr. Scanlon, you some general questions, and then I'll come to the issue of delayed discharge. Yes, well, really just to stay on Exhibit 11, and I'm just pursuing a line of questions that uh, I asked the, the last time. Can I just put on the record that I actually find it quite depressing, Dr Henry's point about uh, she's now getting evidence of joined-up partnerships and put on the record that some of us have been waiting for that for 15 years. Um, and that's undoubtedly very slow. But it's on Exhibit 11. We're now four years into a 10-year commitment. And uh, if I can just go uh, through the points, you have achieved three out of eight commitments. So a uh, record card, not so good then. Uh, the first commitment, we will double the proportion of the budget. You've actually reduced the budget, 9.2 to 8. Commitment three, change fund. There's no evidence. Commitment five... There's not even a definition of what waste and unnecessary variation is. So if the Scottish Government hasn't even got a definition, we're a long way from getting a measurement. Uh, the next one, uh, number seven, which the convener and other colleagues have mentioned, uh, national data not available. So no way of measuring that one either. And on number eight, commitment number eight, no centrally available uh, information. Now... <laughs> Are you deliberately uh, not conforming to the data, information, definition, measurement needs that are required by Audit Scotland and required essential part of this committee's work in <coughs> order for us to do our task? Uh, are you deliberately not providing this data and in another six years' time when this is over will we still be asking the same questions or can you give us a good reason why you are indeed hampering the work of measurement which hampers the job of Audit Scotland and people like myself? I never deliberately withhold anything from the Audit Committee and if I do it inadvertently I try to put it right. Well, it's Audit Scotland's report. It's all here. The information is just not there. And I've quoted from the report, Exhibit 11. And I acknowledge that, Ms Scanlon. I think um, we're uh, less than halfway through the programme. I've already said to the committee that this report has caused me to reflect on whether there is more information that we ought to be uh, gathering centrally. But if we are serious about local partnerships, we also have to be serious about delegating both responsibility and authority to them to deliver in ways which are meaningful to the communities that they serve. The, in, in point five in Exhibit 11, you draw attention to the fact that the Scottish Government has not defined what it means by waste and unnecessary variation in practice and performance. One of the purposes of the Joint Improvement Team is to uh, enable us to discover best practice and to share it. So where we see practice that is good, we seek to share that. Where we see practice that is less good, we seek to draw the attention of the partnerships to the fact that there are better opportunities elsewhere. Um, a definition of waste uh, 
which would be a national one uh, might not be applicable locally. However, if the committee wants me to reflect on uh, whether it's possible to produce a definition of that, I'm more than happy to do that. I simply point out that if we have delegated to local partnerships, we may then end up producing national definitions which are not uh, helpful to them. Uh, I do, uh, Ms Scanlon, want to record that, that there is no point at which I would deliberately, however, withhold information from a committee of this Parliament. The, the, the point you made there, um, you said you would consider whether or not um, you, you, you could define what was made, meant by waste and unnecessary variation. Am I correct? Yeah, that's correct, Kinrina. But if you're not sure about whether you should or could define it, then why say that you'll improve quality through reducing waste and unnecessary variation if you don't know what, what that means? What I'm saying, Convener, is that it will be different in different localities. So yeah, but, but you don't know what it means. So, so how, can, how can you improve quality and productivity if you've got a commitment that you, you actually don't know what, the, what it means? Well, it will mean different things in different localities. That's the point. And if I produce a national definition which is singular and linear, then that, will, that, that might inhibit the um, development of systems which are appropriate to different localities. So, for example, I, I, it might be an unnecessary variation in a, um, say, in an urban area to have certain practices in relation to admissions or whatever it may be, but it might be a, an entirely appropriate variation in a rural area because the whole set of circumstances is different. And if I created the national definition of that, then I would simply be saying that everything had to be the same everywhere, and that's precisely the opposite of what we want to achieve. So does each locality then have its own target for reducing waste and unnecessary variation in practice and performance? That <coughs> is, as I've said, something I'm thoughtful about as to how no, we no, could No, no, I'm not asking about, you know, thoughtful. I'm, I'm asking in terms of this commitment and what you've just said about no national definition. Are there local definitions there will available be, just now? There will be, and Dr Henry will be able to say a little about that. Yeah. It, it's a reality of life that there is variation in, in the way services are used by people and in the way services are provided and, and delivered. And what we're working, what we're doing as, a, as an improvement team is working with partnerships to help them understand their local data and understand the variation and ask the question why, what that's about. So, um, as, as Paul has said, if there is a variation in admission rates or use of a particular service across different localities within the partnership, what are the reasons for that? Is it justified on the basis of demography, equity? And if not, what are they doing about it to try and smooth out that variation? Well, after those answers, I'm not really confident in one, two, three, or indeed six years' time that we're actually going to have these measurements, so uh, I'll, I'll move on from there. Commitment one says that you'll double the proportion of the budget for health and social care. It's been reduced. Why? Given that there's an up to 22% increase in uh, the number of over 65s, which has been increasing for decades now. Why did you promise to double the budget and yet reduced it? Budgets, of course, are, are set in, in the Parliament. Um, so why did the Scottish Government promise to double the budget and then reduce it? Well, th there would be a, a range of decisions taken by ministers in relation to setting the budget. Um, and again, we're only part way into uh, a 10-year programme. Uh, the figures I entirely accept is, however, um, there are a range of uh, other factors that come into uh, determining how much of the health and social care budget for older people uh, is spent on, on care at home over the life of the plan. Um, and the, the, uh, there is a, it's a proportion spent uh, on care at home. Now, the 9.2 per cent of the total health and social care spending on people aged 65 or over spent on, on home care reduced slightly, but that doesn't mean that in the course of this uh, it, can't go, it can't go up again. 
Could, could, you, could you maybe state for the record um, what, when you say you will double the proportion, um, from what percentage to what percentage? What, what are you doubling it from and to? I can't at this point. Convener, I would have to check the exact numbers. I don't want to give something to the committee that would be that, 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 that would be inaccurate or misleading, but I'm happy to come back with that. I do understand that, but you, you are clearly, though, saying to the committee that there is a figure that you have as a baseline, and when you say you will double it, you know what you're going to double it to. Those figures exist. They should do, but I'm, I, I don't have them in the, in, on the top of my head, and it also includes third sp sector spend uh, in this area, uh, which is not represented here in the IRF data. So I would want to come back uh, so on paper to the committee. And is answer is, that is the baseline figure somewhere around the eight or nine percent, and that you're hoping to double double that to sixteen or eighteen percent? That's my under, that's my understanding, convener. But I would so like you, to you, give you, you an accurate to the committee in writing on yeah. that. Okay. Uh, well, I do understand it's for care at home, and I, I don't want to repeat the question in the first half hour between the convener, Willie Coffey, and Bob Doris, because my understanding was that the budget for care at home was to be doubled because you didn't want elderly people languishing in acute be beds, uh, delayed discharge, or indeed long-term institutional care. And that is why the commitment, which has been here since 1999 and is clearly stated here, and it does reflect the convener's initial questions, that more of the focus will be on preventive care and care at home. Uh, but that's, re that, that's reducing. So can I just move on to, we've got uh, additional figures from Audit Scotland. Uh, and also, I think it's reflected in paragraph 36 or something. But in actual fact, four out of 32 local authorities, four, increased their funding in the last financial year on home care and social care. Four out of 32. And we've got additional information. I, I won't go through it all, but if I could just... Spending on home care as a percentage of the total health care budget. Now, if we look at areas like West Dumbarton, 2% of their health care budget on home care, North Lanarkshire, 12 per cent. If we go to the average number of home care hours, we've got uh, Angus, 4.2 per cent. We've got South Ayrshire, 16, not 4.2, 4.2 hours. We've got Lanarkshire, 16, four times greater. And if we also look at the home care clients, uh, as a percentage of the population in Highland, 3.9, and West Dumbarton, 9. Why are there such huge disparities, three times and four times greater, between the, the number of clients, the number of hours, the uh, percentage of the budget? Why are there such disparities between council areas within Scotland? I know you say that where best practice exists, it will be rolled out. So are some doing it better than others? Are you monitoring what's happening uh, with this information we've got from the Auditor General? Are you auditing what's happening in local authorities? And are you indeed pulling up those who are not meeting best practice? I'll ask Gillian Barclay to comment on that, Ms Scanlon. I think um, I, I would emphasise again that, that the delivery of care in a rural setting will be different from an urban setting. Inner city will be different from uh, smaller um, townships. Um, but uh, Gillian will give you uh, some background to why there is this degree of variation. But to answer, first of all, Ms Scanlon, your fair question about uh, what are we doing, that's precisely what we are asking the Joint Improvement Team to do, is to point out to the local partnerships where there are these variations, some of which can be explained, but if they can't be explained by um, evidence and data, then what is going to be done to resolve? Before, sorry, yeah. just before Gillian Bartley comes in, can you confirm, irrespective of the variation in, in percentages, which you, know, you say down to local circumstances, that the commitment means that all of them will be expected to double what they, they provide? Oh, I wouldn't say that, convener, because uh, if, what, what we're saying is that, if I go back to the exhibit, 
double the proportion of the total health and social care budget for older people that is spent on care at home over the life of the plan. So I'm not going to say that every, every authority or every partnership will exactly double it. Some may be slightly lower, some may be slightly higher. And, and that, again, if, if, a, if a partnership was already just demonstrating excellent practice and was at the right level, I'm not going to force them to do more ju just for the sake of making them do more. But I do, I do have to say, I, I, I do not accept, as a member of this Parliament for the Highlands and Islands, I keep a close eye on remote and rural spending. I do not accept that that's the reason for the disparity in convener, if I can just put on record. Spending on home care for older people by council area, the lowest, West Dumbarton, 2%, uh, the highest, North Lanarkshire, 12.6%, six times greater. Now, I, I know I've come from Inverness, and, but... I uh, do, don't think either of those areas could be considered remote and rural or even island. Sorry, Gillian Barclay. Yes, thank you, Convener. I think I just wanted to explain some of the um, variations. There are undoubtedly big variations in the way that local authorities have commissioned and provided care for older people. We looked some years ago, because this issue you highlighted um, in a previous committee, about the difference between, for example, Angus and Dundee, which are very close uh, in terms of geography, you would think that the services would be very similar. We found in that instance that in Angus more care was being categorised as home support rather than care at home and it was the way that the um, local authorities had accounted for and, and measured the uh, spend. Now Angus had developed their housing uh, with care a lot more than Dundee at that time. I think there's probably a, a levelling out in those two areas now, but a lot of the spend was in housing rather than social care. So it was actually just the way that the, the service had been described. But even with that explanation, I'm sure there are uh, big variations in the way that um, local authorities and their partners have commissioned um, support for people in their own homes. And how it's been categorised hasn't been helpful. It's been categorised. Uh, the source is Audit Scotland, and it is their analysis of the integrated resource framework data 2011-2012. Uh, and if you've not found that helpful, that's a discussion that we can have with Audit Scotland. I'll leave it there. Say, convener, just for clarification, uh, what Gillian is saying is not that the Audit Scotland report is unhelpful, mm -hmm. but the way that the local authorities initially classified the information that they gave, and that's one of the areas of variation that we'd like to remove. So that when we're talking about a set of numbers, we're talking about the same baseline and the same attribution of spend. So I can understand why the committee finds this difficult. So do we, and that's one of the things that we want to try to sort. In discharge, I have some questions, but I'll allow Willie Coffey to come in on that first. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah. Themes that, that was discussed at the previous uh, committee on delayed discharge. I mean, the Auditor General in our report on page 36 of our main report had indicated that some some good progress had been made since 2007 in this, but but nevertheless, the figures were still high, and I think there's a an average statistic in the year that it was equivalent to 837 hospital beds being occupied for a year or so by by patients who are clinically ready to <coughs> leave hospital. So it was just to, to ask you what progress are we making in this. I, I know there will be reasons for these things occurring, but the picture uh, as submitted by Audit Scotland in the follow-up papers for this, for this meeting, members on page 29 and page 30, shows quite a variation in the health boards across Scotland about how this how this is treated. So it was just to ask you, what progress are we making in this? Because I've got to remind myself, convener, that we're the audit committee and we're looking for some opportunities, any opportunities to make savings where they can be made. So what's happening at the moment? Is the picture improving and what are we doing about it across the health boards to, to get some kind of standardised practice in this area? Well... Mr Coffey, the situation on um, delayed dis discharge, uh, I think I would say, uh, remains uh, an issue. Um, as you've rightly said, we've seen a reduction since January 2007 from 793 patients delayed for longer than four weeks. And at the present moment, the latest data I have, 
there are 254, that's a reduction of 68%. But that, that, I say, on the record, is still not good enough. Um, the issue is now being raised uh, at chief executive and chair level in the NHS uh, Scotland boards. And I know, by way of an example, um, that the chief executive of NHS Lothian and the chief executive of City of Edinburgh Council are now meeting weekly to discuss what further can be done within the areas they serve on reducing um, further uh, delayed discharges. Um, over 70% of the over four-week delays were in a non-acute setting, such as a community hospital or a care home or a general hospital ward. I mention that because um, the, the, the real, in my view, the real impact on patients is being delayed in an acute ward. I'm not, uh, we, ought, we ought to fix it all, but if I was prioritising something, it would be delays in the acute ward. And tackling delays discharges is one of the main reasons not the only one why we legislated, the government legislated to integrate health and social care, um, because we believe that that integration is an important component of our uh, approach to, to tackling, uh, better, to providing better outcomes uh, for patients. The Joint Improvement Team and the Care Inspectorate are working with NHS boards and local authorities um, to drive up the quality of care in the community to ensure that there are, there are, there are decent and good places for um, uh, patients to be discharged from hospital. I don't know whether, Anne, you want to say more about what we're doing mm -hmm. on, on delayed discharges. Mm -hmm. We have, a, um, have for some time had delayed discharge learning events for staff from health and social care who are involved in the discharge planning and the discharge pathways home for, for people. And we have really built up, again, a, a level of good practice that is being shared nationally. Some of that is now being woven through the unscheduled care um, programme so that people further upstream in the hospital understand what they need to do to promote good discharge practice. Um, a number of partnerships have commissioned and now operate discharge hubs that are integrated single point of contact, discharge hubs that bring together the health and social care equipment and adaptations processes to help people get home quickly. And there are also um, pieces of work we're doing at the moment with partnerships around helping them understand the revised guidance on choice, including the application of choosing a care home to move on when somebody has um, lost capacity to make their decision. So under the Adult with Incapacity Act, so we're supporting all of the, the boards to train their staff in applying that refreshed guidance. We're also working with colleagues um, from Justice in terms of the guidance and the process to go through when somebody does have um, issues with capacity and might require a, a guardianship or an intervention order. So we're working with colleagues from Mental Health and, and Justice on that. So that's just a, a, a flavour of some of the practical work that we're doing with partnerships. I would, I would also highlight that, as, as Paul has said, particularly with regards to Lothian, Edinburgh City, but Edinburgh City and Aberdeen City are recognised to have some very specific challenges with regards to recruitment to the care sector, which is tied in to a bigger community planning agenda around the uh, e economic situation in those areas and the, um, y you know, the wage of um, the average wage that people can can be paid in other um, occupations, other other sectors. No, I mean, the example on page 28 of the additional papers convener um, shows that you know the rates of bed days lost in Orkney. My colleague Liam MacArthur sitting here is as low as 239 days, but if you look at East Lothian, it's 1,679. I mean, that's a Absolutely incredible difference. Is that all attributable to our inability to recruit care sector staff to, to deal with the discharge position? Surely not. <laughs> it, the delayed discharge um, expert group report from, I think it was 2012, is 
it very much sets out what are the common issues that are influencing these figures. And that report really still is extant and they're often a mixture of some practice issues, some issues around ability to recruit to the care sector, but there's also some issues in terms of the ability to move people on to care home placements because in some areas uh, the resilience and stability of the care home sector has been um, a, an issue. So that's something we're working with the care inspector on and also with our policy colleagues in terms of the residential care task force. Then it would be an opportunity to have these kinds of options and choices available for people locally, you, you would imagine. But the, um, the, the costs of independent sector care homes in the, the Lothian areas are extremely high mm -hmm. and well beyond what is the sort of national care home contract rate. So people just stay in the hospital longer then in East Lothian because it's too expensive in a care home? Uh, as Paul said, this is an issue that is being tackled at a very high level by chief execs in health and in local authority. In fact, um, NHS Lothian and the Edinburgh City Partnership had a very high level meeting at the beginning of this month to look at some of the really transformational ambitious models that they require to implement to design themselves out of this situation. First of all, there aren't any private sector care homes in Orkney. Um, I think that there isn't a market there, unfortunately, uh, in that respect. Um, I think some of the issues in Lothian are quite deep-rooted and will take some time to resolve in terms of recruitment and retention of staff. Mm. Um, there have been issues over quality, as Anne rightly says, and we're hoping to address that in partnership with um, the care inspectorate, his and the private providers themselves. Just finally then, when will we see some real progress in this? And if, if we're looking at this, say, in a, a year's time, will we see a, a much improved picture? Do we, do we anticipate? I think I'll, I'll... <laughs> I'll take that one, Mr <laughs> Coffey. Um, I hope we will. There is an enormous amount of effort going into this. Um, uh, but the, as, as Gillian has rightly said, for example, the circumstances in in the Lothians are pretty deep-rooted and long-standing, and what we can't do uh, is alter the, if you like, the economic context in which this is being delivered, which is to say that, as, as colleagues have said, um, there is better remunerated work available very close at hand in some areas, and that, that is one of, one of the key issues. Um, it, Overall, 30% of people delayed over four weeks were waiting for a suitable care home place and 25% were waiting for a care package to go home. So I only mention these figures to say that we aren't, we're, we're not just taking this in the round. We're, we're looking at the specifics um, area by area. Um, but but the, answer in, the answer in Edinburgh and in the Lothians is, is not necessarily the answer uh, elsewhere. Um, I, if I may... Uh, also say that I mean the the figures have gone up. I mean we, we, we're at 254, which is higher than we were. I'd like to see that trend start coming down. I'm uh, not, however, going to say now that I think it will be zero in a year's time. Mm -hmm. I don't think that. Which could be that just Billy Coffey's uh, reference to Orkney as an example. I had me look, looking back at the, uh, the figures, and I'm conscious that um, the caveats around uh, any kind of statistical analysis with a population the size of Orkney is always um, problematic. But I, I think in, in relation to the figures uh, Willie Coffey's just uh, referred to in terms of, of, of bed blocking, I'm wondering how those correlate with the figures that Mary Scanlon was discussing previously in terms of percentage of older population using hospital and social care services where um, there seems to be a far higher than average um, uh, number in, in Orkney um, in hospital lines of day case, uh, inpatients or the admer emergency admissions. There's uh, identified as no home care clients and, and, and are probably lower than average residents in, in care homes. And how that tallies with uh, a figure in terms of delayed discharge, which just looks kind of heroically successful. Can you 
Is there a mechanical what page you're on? Um, I'm on <laughs> I, I, I'm across two different documents, 29 in the, in the, additional, um, in the additional information, and Exhibit 10 on the, um, on, on the main report, which is page 24. Right. I'm not sure that I have the uh, additional information that you have, but... It's uh, in the world of... It's all right. It's all right. So, page. It's 29 of the additional information that exhibit, <coughs> exhibit one, which, one which Willie, yeah. Willie Coffey yeah. was just referring to, which is Orkney at the far right end of the of the table. Yeah, sure. And he's closing it together. So, uh, yes, and and and. Um, and, and then Exhibit 10 in the in the um, in the audit report um, seems to have um, no home care clients, precious few residents in, in care home settings, uh, and everybody else in hospital. Whereas we've got a delayed discharge um, rate there, which, as I say, should be the aspiration of all by the looks of things. Yeah, uh, and uh, yes, and so the the question is how 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 can you have such a high percentage of the population uh, apparently uh, using hostel services, but the delayed discharge is not is not a problem. I guess is is, is yeah. and uh, I think that's something to do with the the integration of the system in Orkney, um, which is a, a, you know in my view um, a good example of a highly integrated system uh, between um, uh, health and local government. Um, I, I think that it is to do with the fact that, as Gillian has said, the provision uh, of uh, care home places is controlled uh, effectively by, by the public sector. There isn't there isn't there isn't a, a market for um, private private care. So that that it's it's that combination of factors I think to do with the integration uh, of the system, and that is one of the issues that we're seeking to tackle. Um, and I know that, that both um, Tim Davison in health and Sue Bruce in local government are seeking to tackle is how can, how can they better integrate the systems, for example, in Edinburgh to ensure that, that there's that speed of flow which is actually beneficial to patients. A couple of questions on delayed discharge. Could, could you clarify, Mr Gray, you, you said that the, um, the figures had come down from, I think it was 793 to 254. That's correct. Um, since 2007, that was for a period longer than four weeks. Has that definition been the one that has always applied, or has the the definition changed at any point? The four weeks. As far as I, as far as I know, but Dr. Henry, we've we've always recorded um, delays um, in terms of the numbers of weeks. Originally, in 2001, the original target was for reducing delays over six weeks. In 2001, there were 2,162 delays over six weeks, with an average delay of 153 days. Um, in 2013, that had gone down to 100 delays over six weeks, with an average duration of 22 days. Obviously, we are not complacent and we are incrementally trying to increase the scale of ambition. So the target has dropped to four weeks and we are working towards uh, a target of two weeks. And many partnerships that I support are actually starting to work to practice where you know, they are looking to turn this around to... 72 hours and more so you know there's no sense anywhere in Scotland that anyone's complacent about this target no, I, I think uh, those challenging targets are, are commendable um, can I ask a, 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 a question about what circumstances are doing to you um, in, in terms of trying to to deliver you know one of the things that we've done over um, the years is introduced more rigorous inspections and standards for private care homes. And I think that is quite right, that if any of us have loved ones in a, in a care home, we want to know that they're being properly supported. And from time to time, we see some horrendous 
examples, you know, just recently, the last few days down in England, but it has happened um, here as well. Now, allied to that legitimate demand for, for, for higher uh, standards, we've also got the understandable and legitimate um, reduction in hospital beds. I think it's what, about 6,000 beds have been reduced uh, you know, in the last few years. And then in between that, you've got the problem of, of delayed discharges. So you're reducing hospital beds, but you know, of those fewer beds, we now have a number of people uh, blocking those beds because there are no um, care home places available. <coughs> now, staying with uh, the Lothians that was mentioned, we have a problem in some parts of the Lothians. I think Cadenborough is one example of where, I, I don't know what the precise figure is, but it's somewhere around 25% of the available uh, care home beds are not available because of inspection concerns. So given you know, what you've said to Willie Coffey about Lothians and you've explained all the, the financial uh, pressures that you can't get staff, to, to work in homes or to work in home care jobs. Then added to that, this removal of something like 25% of home care beds in, in Edinburgh. What's happening? Um, because in Edinburgh and the Lothians, there is clearly a crisis developing. And, and some of that is not entirely, you know, I, I'm not, it's not seeking to apportion blame because, you know, I wouldn't for a minute want the standards of inspection in home care um, to, to, to be reduced. It's absolutely the right thing to do. But how, what, what then happens where you have this perfect storm of not being able to recruit staff because you know, a, a more vibrant economic market, 25% of home care beds being removed because of the inspection regime, and then pressure on hospital beds, which has been reduced by about 6,000. So what's happening to, to this crisis in Edinburgh and the Lothians? I'll invite colleagues to come in in a second. I think the, 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 one thing to, to say, I mean, convener, you've, you've rightly drawn attention to the complexity of the, of, of the system and the situation. I think the other thing we're trying to do, of course, is reduce admissions. So in other words, you, you, you have, if you have fewer people coming in, you have fewer people needing to go out again, and that's one of the, I think, one of the things we are keen to do. Admissions to hospital. So, if you... If admissions to hospital? Of older people, we are, oh, older working, people. We are working hard mm. to achieve that, and indeed, um, I've seen evidence in one small area, not, not in Edinburgh, of um, reduction of admission of older people by, by 50%, which is, which is very welcome. <laughs> but the... the so uh, I think Dr Henry alluded briefly to the fact that we're working with um, local authority and the inspection regimes and the <coughs> private care providers to overcome the issues that have, uh, that have caused us to have to put a moratorium on, on, on allowing them to accept uh, more people. Um, so that's one of the things uh, that, that we're doing, and, and, and Dr Henry might, might want to say a bit more about that. We'll we're working with Care Inspectorate, Scottish Care and local partnerships to actually take a bit of a deeper dive into some examples where there have been, for good reason, a moratorium applied to admission to work out what could we have done, what could have been done by the partnership earlier on to get early warning that that was going to happen and what could the partnership have done to try and address some of those issues before it got to that point, or if the, issue, the quality issues um, had emerged, what could have been done to improve the quality together, jointly, across independent sector, health and, and council. So that the learning from some of those deep dives that we're doing at the moment with a number of partnerships in Forth Valley and in the Lothians, we will then take and transfer that learning with other partnerships. Um, similar works being done in Highland um, with this of improving quality approach that they're taking with the integrated authority and with the um, independent providers. So obviously 
quality of care has to be paramount, um, but this is increasingly becoming what we're placing at the heart of the joint commissioning. What is the, what is the menu of services that are, it, we desire to have in a locality? So their joint strategic commissioning programme that is working with every partnership in Scotland to look at their joint commissioning plans are really looking at what is the model of care that we want to commission. Is it care home, hospital, care at home? Are there other models, particularly what is the role of housing with care moving forward? And again, as recently as um, beginning of April, some quite ambitious, exciting concepts in, in Edinburgh around care village, care campus, uh, to replace some of the existing facilities that, that, that we have. Is there a problem at the moment in Edinburgh and the Lothians? We, you know, we've just discussed um, yeah. around this, this table that there are issues in Edinburgh and the Lothians and there's a recognition of that at a very high level and work underway to, to tackle that in a sustainable way. OK. Um, can I move on to change one? Ken McIntosh. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And, uh, thank you. I think it's central to this uh, whole agenda is this idea that we, we shift budgets from... Um, from the acute sector to um, community and, and care at home, uh, certainly it's, it's the focus, it's the, it's the number one uh, commitment in the, of the eight uh, reshaping care commitments. It's the number one and the number three commitment, in fact. But the Auditor General has pointed out that um, instead of shifting resources, um, we're going in exactly the opposite direction. The funding on acute care is going up and the funding on community care and on local government is going down. Can I just ask for your comments on why that is the case? I think the, the, the process of, of, of shifting the balance of care um, is, is complex and takes time. And I think part of the, one of the reasons, for, of course, where you would see expenditure in the acute sector rising would, would, would be through capital investment, uh, in, uh, for example, in Glasgow. Um, I think that, 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 that nevertheless remains our ambition to, to, to shift that over time, and that's why we're doing what we're doing. I think we can give evidence, and I think the Joint Improvement Team has um, provided some evidence to that end on their submission on the ways in which the Change Fund has actually changed the way in which uh, uh, funding is, is assigned to different aspects. And if it's helpful, I can ask Dr Henry to give... Um, some some insight into that. But uh, I'm not ignoring your core point, Mr McIntosh, and I do want to be clear about that, that, the, that, that a decisive shift from, uh, you know, out from acute to, to uh, non-acute is, 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 still, is, is still work in progress. So, uh, Just, all you've said, the reason for why it's not happening is it's difficult, it's complex. Because redesigning a system like a health and social care system is complex. Um, we're, we're, we're effectively uh, in the integration of health and social care. We're bringing together you know, parts of what is delivered by the health service, parts of what's delivered by local government, and what's delivered by the third sector. That's complex and it takes time. I'm not saying it's difficult, so we're giving up. I'm saying it's difficult because it's complex. The Auditor General points out in, in her report on page 16, paragraph 23, that between 2002 and 2009 <coughs> the council spend on social care increased by 40%. So it is possible to do it. It increased by 40% over this period. Now, interestingly, obviously, reshaping care for old people came in in 2010, and since then, spending has declined. Now, I, I, do, I just don't understand that. So we had a 40% increase before reshaping care, and since reshaping care came in, spending in local authorities and council services has declined. Spending in the acute sector has continued to increase. Now, it was clearly it was as complex then as it is now. What, what is happening? Why? I don't get the reason of why. What is stopping this process? It is the number one commitment and the number three commitment in, re in, in reshaping care, and it's not happening. Can you just give me some feeling of why? better place to give you the detail, but I think, um, for example, expenditure on free personal and nursing care would partly explain the change in, in the trend that you've, you've drawn attention to. Mm -hmm. 
Jillian's probably best place to reflect on the free personal care trends and then I'll follow on with um, some of the issues around the, d the demand on acute care. Sure, yeah. yeah. You've um, highlighted an increase in expenditure between the periods... Sorry. 2002, 03, um, 2009 and 10. Yes, we increased the budget for local authority social work spend to... Um, match the increase in demand as a result of the introduction of free personal care in 2003. Um, and I, I guess that accounts for quite a large of that um, aspect of that expenditure. Over time, the numbers of people receiving free personal care is still growing, um, but the expenditure per head is perhaps um, levelling off. Uh, and the amount of social care budgets which are uh, which are um, sucked up, if you like, by free personal care has increased over time. I think in terms of the difference in, in spend between local authorities um, is quite stark as well. Some local authorities are spending a fair amount more on social work than others. To the, the variation yes. between, this is a national picture. This is across all local authorities. Local authority spending, since this particular set of commitments was brought in, has actually declined. In other words, you know, just at the very point where, in theory, this becomes the political priority and the healthcare priority, exactly the reverse of what we're seeing is happening. And I still can't say, I mean, it's a helpful explanation for why, it, why, why the figures rose, or partly rose, between 2002 and 2009. It doesn't explain why they've stopped rising. They should have continued to rise. I mean, the demand is increasing. Why is it not continuing to rise? Who, who are, can I just ask, is it Mr Gray, is it the joint improvement team that are taking these decisions? Who's taking the decisions that is, that is stopping, what is, is, is leading to the decline in one budget and the increase in another? Well, the decisions on what local authorities spend are taken by local authorities, not, not by me. If, that, if, that, if, if I've understood your question, Mr. McIntosh. Well, I'm, I'm, trying to get, I'm trying to work out why. You know, we are trying to work, we're trying to audit the spend of a major government programme which is trying to shift. I mean, it's a, a big, it is a complex process, as you see. It was one which was having some success, you know, we could argue about how successful it was, but it was having some success between 2002 and 2009. And clearly, instead of that success being built on, we're going into reverse. We're going in the opposite direction. I'm trying to work out why. What has changed? What decisions have been taken? Who is taking these decisions? Well, as I say, local authorities are taking the decisions about what local authorities spend. But the, one of the issues, of course, in, in the way that we're approaching the integration of health and social care is that there are better ways of doing things. They don't all need to cost more money, and indeed some of them can cost less. We, for example, we, we're, we, we have um, approaches to... Um, better approaches to prescribing of medicines, which I, I, are... I, I'm sorry, I'm not going to stop you because I, I agree with what you're yeah. saying. But the point is, it's a very specific aim of the programme, of the government. It's a very specific aim to increase the budget. You know, I assume also to get better value and so on and to produce better care. Well, I know it is. But it's a very specific aim to increase the budget. So what you're saying is the key reason is because local authorities are not spending enough money on social care. That's the key reason. No, I, I am absolutely... I, I was answering your question as factually as I could. Who makes the decisions about that? That's the local authorities. That, that's what they do. Are they part of this process? Are they they're part of the joint improvement team? Are they not? Um, cause local, local authorities? At a strategic level, COSLA is, is one of the national partners in the joint improvement team. And at a local level, the, the local authority is absolutely part of the local partnership that is taking forward reshaping care. Mm. At a local level, however, um, the, the partnerships are recognising that the change fund is 1% to 1.5% of the total budget for older people. And the real issue is how they spend the 100%, and that's their integrated resource framework. And that's exactly what they're looking at as part of joint commissioning. And the legislation around integration will give us some additional leverage in terms of seeing that as a joint budget and making best use of the public pound. Is the change fund itself, has that actually produced... Why, why hasn't the change fund produced an increase in spending? In you, it, I would find it difficult to understand why the change fund, which is 1% to 1.5% of the total budget, could exercise that level of leverage. Yeah. It has been a catalyst for a different way of working, new relationships mm -hmm. across partners and including 
greater use of the third sector partners? I don't know whether it would be helpful to explain. No, that's fine. I, I want to keep it at the high level of the current moment. Uh, last week, when we asked, sorry, not last week, the 2nd of April, when we asked our various uh, witnesses to give evidence, uh, Katrina Renfrew in particular was very clear on this point, and she said that um, you know, reshaping care may be a pr priority, but when it comes to health budgets, the priority is actually uh, access, acute access, uh, drug budgets, and waiting times. She said very clearly, that's when it comes to allocating acute budgets, those are the drivers, not reshaping care. Was she accurate in saying that? I'm sure Katrina Renfrew was accurate in giving her view of how, <coughs> how she saw it. As far as I'm concerned, I need to look at the thing in the round. Um, if you were talking, you were you're talking to the director of strategy, I think, at NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. That's that's Katrina's role, if I if I've got that right. Um, and what she was telling you was, um, I'm quite sure, accurate insofar as, as insofar as she represented it. What I can tell you is that we have, I have chaired a number of discussions with. NHS chief executives now since I came in December and I have been clear and Dr Henry's been at, at, at one of uh, at least one of these meetings I've been clear about the importance we attach to the overall integration program and the cabinet secretary has been clear with the chairs about the importance he attaches to seeing in future um, delivery local delivery plans a commitment to that shift so, uh, you know, at, at my level, at the Cabinet Secretary's level, I'm clear about the commitment to that shift. I'm clear also, and I've acknowledged and you've accepted, for which I'm grateful, Mr McIntosh, it's difficult and it's complex. But you know, I, I, think, I'd say, I think for the Audit Committee, what's important is there's no point, I mean, I don't think any of us here is wishing to berate anybody in this mm -hmm. panel, or in the Health Service particularly, because you're clearly trying to do, you, you've got the, uh, a clear focus on, on the target. But if you're not being given the money, there's a, the First Minister is fond of using the expression "follow the money." If the money is not going into, if the money is actually going into acute care, and it's not going into local government services, and if a political priority is being set for waiting times, acute access uh, medicines, and not being given to older people's care, then there's very little you can do. You're actually trying to take decisions while the money is going elsewhere. Am I right or, or wrong in that assessment? I'm, I'm working within the budgetary framework set by the Parliament, and that's my, that's my responsibility, and it's my responsibility, as I do, to, to give account to this committee and others of how, uh, how I manage that. But I, I am clear that we've set out a strategy and we've set out priorities for the boards, and we are asking them in future local delivery plans to come forward with their proposals about how they're going to achieve that. Just one other question is that priority three in the reshaping care agenda says that um, by stimulating shifts in the totality uh, of the budget from institutional care to home, you will enable subsequent decommissioning of acute sector provision. Now, Ronald Mayer last week, was uh, two weeks ago, was very clear that you will not be closing hospitals, and yet it seems to be a very specific aim. Why, would you question whether three is actually an accurate target? Well, well, one of the <coughs> one of the things that, that um, <coughs> NHS Lothian are, are mentioned as, a, as as an opportunity was uh, the transformation of a provision which had been for acute s service delivery into something which would be better um, transformed for a step down facility or a care home, a care village, as Dr. Henry said. So, I. I, I I would say that there are opportunities, and I would say that, that uh, chief executives are currently active in pursuing these. Okay, so you expect some hospitals to close? Can you tell me which ones? <laughs> well, I um, think it's quite important, isn't it? Just, uh, I, well, what, I'm, what I can tell you is that in, 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 in Lothian, uh, and I mean, Dr Hendry will give you the detail, um, in Lothian they, they have identified areas which were used as, as acute settings which are, are now available for transformation. Mm -hmm. Um, and similar, I suppose, just a, a very, we've, we've had some personal stories this morning, so I'll give you my personal story, is that I'm a geriatrician and I normally would be practising um, specialist support for rehabilitation in hospital, um, and that ward is no longer required because the, the cohort of older people who would normally have gone there are being supported directly at home 
or in some you know more community and homely setting so the reality is it is happening it's an incremental emergent process rather than a big bang but the the, the shift is happening thank you Mira. Um, it's a supplementary to the well, I'd like to touch on one or two things that Ken McIntosh has mentioned just now, but maybe from the beginning I'd like to say that one thing that stands out in the Attorney General's report is the huge number of areas where there is a lack of good data, which obviously affects this committee and our ability to uh, take conclusions from it. I mean, if you look at paragraph 70, care at home, there's a lack of information on the need for care at home. The figures we've got don't even cover direct payments to buy home care. Primary care, <coughs> national data on primary care services is limited. And this must cause everybody who's trying to extract trend analysis or you know, looking to the future as to how this is going to develop an enormous amount of difficulty. So I think that obviously this must be, and I hope it is, very much a priority to try and get good data out on which to base uh, uh, decisions in the future. Um, I was looking at paragraph 38, uh, which uh, covers uh, something that Ken McIntosh turned on, which is the uh, intensive home care being used as a, as a, as a sort of criteria. Intensive home care uh, is going up, whereas uh, the number of people receiving home care have actually fallen. Does this indicate, and is there any evidence that this indicates, that uh, councils are actually raising the bar in order to try and deal with people in a more acute situation, but the people at the bottom, maybe with slightly less needs, are maybe, are maybe falling out. I'm happy to pick it up first and give colleagues a chance to, 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 to contemplate what they want to say. I, it, so, the, 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 Mr. Beatty, to go to your first point about, about data, I think I've already said to the committee that one of the uh, things that this report has made me do is to reflect on the adequacy of data and at what level it ought to be collected. I, so I, I make that point again. I hope it wasn't the Attorney General or I'm in more trouble than I thought I was. Um, I keep using that term, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, in, in terms of the uh, paragraph 38, um, the, the problem is with, with measures which are proxies of other things, it is, it is not always simple to determine what the, what, what the reality is. Um, but you're pointing to the second last sentence, I think, which is indi indicate the percentage of home care clients re receiving intensive home care has increased from 24 to 32, but the number of people receiving home care has fallen over that same period. Is that, is that the, the, the distinction you're drawing out for us? So um, some of the home care, of course, that people receive now um, is delivered through... The, the third sector, which means that it's not recorded in the same way as it would have been uh, in 2005, because the voluntary sector is providing more than it did then. Um, so that's one that's one explanation. Um, the, 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 the other uh, explanation is that um, the, I, I think the the way in which people receive home care now, there's, there's, I think there's, a, there's greater dependence on kinship care as well, so care, care by relatives. So these, these factors come in, and, and the problem is, well, not the problem, but the fact is, I mean, we, you know, we don't record that in the same way. And I, and I think I will say to the committee, I'm not about to start a national data collection exercise around that, or we would be, we, we, we would be, in, we'd be in real difficulty. Looking at that figure uh, on that paragraph 38, I would have thought it was reasonable to assume that the number of people receiving home care have dropped, but that's only with the councils. You're saying there's actually another figure out there someplace for those that are receiving it through the third sector, but that's not captured in, this, in these particular figures. So the arguments we're making could be entirely wrong. 
I don't think they're entirely, no, I wouldn't say they're entirely wrong. I'm simply saying there's been a shift in the way that the care has been delivered, and that is one factor which will, will, will play a part in it. I'm sorry, you know, maybe Scott has made a point to me here. Um, do the councils actually not commission that home care, irrespective of the fact it's delivered by independent sure. providers? So they would have that information? Sure. They might, or, or um, but some, some, some uh, individuals, of course, through self-directed support, which would be a different, which is yeah, that, 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 That's model. just a, a recent phenomenon. Yeah. 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 You know, up in, uh, at the time this report was produced, presumably it was all done through the local authorities. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I accept that, but there, there, are, there, is, there are also some people who commission, of course, their own home care support as a, as a matter of... No, but we're not talking about that here. That, that, that's not the focus of this report. No. <clears throat> Well, I mean, Jerry, do you want to say something about the way in which the, 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 the yeah. third sector is engaged sure. in this? And, and if you can help the committee too on the extent to which the um, information is recorded about how uh, the, the third sector is commissioned, I think that would sure. be useful. It's true to say that um, certain third sector organisations are commissioned by statutory organisations to provide uh, formal support to um, individuals. Um, however, it's also equally true that there is a vast amount of voluntary and charitable work out uh, within Scotland that is undertaken with um, no funding from the statutory sector, and that has been going on for... Can I, can I stop you for a moment? That's not what we're talking about in this report. OK, so in terms of the... If I understand what has been said, it's a question of... Are the care packages that have been delivered by the statutory agency for those with um, 10 hours or more, and has that related to a reduction in those requiring less uh, care? I was asked to comment on the voluntary sector's um, input in that. Have I misunderstood the question? No, no, no it's, the voluntary, it's the paid voluntary sector input, I think, that, that was referred to. I was concerned that, from what has been said, that that piece was missed out from the statistics. Yeah. That was all my thing about that. The original question related to is there evidence councils raising the bar resulting in uh, more people get receiving intensive care but less maybe receiving. Yeah. Also, the, the reference that we make to the third sector, the independent and the voluntary sector, and we took evidence from witnesses, is about the paid for services. It's not about the charitable or, or uh, unpaid for work. We're talking about the care that is commissioned, which is the focus of the Audit Scotland report, and we know that from the Audit Scotland report, and indeed from listening to other witnesses, that not all paid for services are delivered by the local authority. Some are delivered by the private sector, some are delivered by the third sector, either voluntary or charity. So that's the focus of this. Mm -hmm. It's not the, the charitable or voluntary activity that people give of their own free will for, for no reward. Mm -hmm. Take that point entirely, I mean, I think the point I was making, which perhaps misled Jerry slightly, was that one of the potential reasons for the number of people receiving <coughs> home care appearing to have fallen is that more use is being made of the unpaid and the voluntary sector, not through statutory uh, commissioning. That was the point I was making. Is that in the Audit Scotland report? It doesn't, but it's, my, it's, it's part of my explanation for the last sentence. All right. Okay, Colin. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, just going back to Colin Beattie, did you have anything thing. else <laughs> uh, before the other comment? Uh, I, was, I was still asking about this question of, is there any evidence of councils raising the bar? Yes. Um, we made requirements in 2010 11 that local authorities start to record the um, risk categories of individual clients who were assessed as needing free personal nursing care. Um, that categorised um, eligibility criteria into low, moderate, uh, substantial and critical. We've been monitoring those statistics over time and the number of people who meet the substantial and critical uh, risk levels have been getting services, 80% of them around about, get that service in about two weeks. I think there is a development of much more support 
for those of moderate and low needs around about um, community alarms and telecare and other types of services which won't necessarily be recorded as home care but they are recorded um, as a different type of package of care. There, you're, you're right to raise the question though and I understand exactly what you're getting at to seeing our councils raising the bar in terms of moderate to substantial to critical. Um, we are seeing some councils who are prioritising those who are critical and substantial above those who are moderate and low. But I don't think they are ignoring the groups who are moderate and low. They are developing services of a different nature for those types of clients. I hope that answers some of that question. Could I just touch on paragraph 23, where the final sentence here uh, says that uh, trend information seems to be a problem really because we're not talking we're talking about specialities and services versus age groups which perhaps to me would be more relevant at the, you know, in terms of gathering information how do, how does that impact not having that information well as i stated in the report uh, mr Beatty, because um, the recording in the nhs uh, of its expenditure is is as described um, then we can assume that certain spe uh, specialties will have a high proportion of older people uh, in them, but there, there is not an absolute and direct correlation. So, for example, um, if you were looking at something, uh, and I know I'm now talking about a condition, but I'm, I'm using it by way of an example, if you're looking at something like dementia, you would assume that it was largely connected with older people, but there are sadly a few younger people uh, come within that, that, that scope as well. So this is the way it's recorded. Uh, and so we're not, we're, we, we don't record or publish in that sense by age. We, you know, I mean, it's fairly clear what, what paediatrics will be about, for example. Um, and it's fairly, it, you know, it, it, it's fairly clear that if someone is seen by a geriatrician, what, what that's likely to be about. But if somebody's seen, say, for cardiac, then you know that, that that doesn't put them into in, in, into a particular uh, age group. I'd like to take you back to um, NHS Lothian and the difficulties that NHS Lothian are facing. And it's really, really just to nail down a couple of things because I think you partially mentioned some of the problems um, in a sort of more general terms. Thinking through, um, obviously we have uh, uh, the differences uh, such as uh, the Royal Victoria that was meant to be um, uh, closed down actually about 10 years ago and it's effectively going to be taken up to this care village situation that they're, they're talking about. Uh, the needed improvements to Royal Edinburgh, the changes to Ashley, Ainsley, Liberton, the fact that uh, Kirstorfen is way past its best and will probably be the four wards that are classified as the hospital will probably end up having to close simply because it's way out of date. Is this, is it, to a certain extent, a uh, perfect storm along with the fact that the Royal Ed uh, Infirmary was, of course, pretty commonly known that it was built too small uh, for the needs? Is this the perfect storm that we're hitting along with some of the problems that we're having in some of the private care homes that are coming in? All the fact that there's some major changes happening that's making the Lothian picture look a little bit worse than you know I would like to think it is. I mean, so Lothian's of course performing well in some areas. I think well, I do uh, agree they are, and it's just that with all the stuff that's having to no, to happen I, between... Indeed, and the conveners made a, a similar point. I think, given the extent of the question you ask, and if you and if the convener was content, I would like to um, ask NHS Lothian to give uh, a note to the committee of what it's doing around that set of issues. Otherwise, I will give you a partial answer. It will not be complete, and I think it would be more helpful to the committee committee to have a complete answer to that. Yeah. You're content, yeah. I, I just thought it would be helpful because of the fact that we'd spent a bit of time, yeah. it was generalised, and although they are doing some things quite well, the pressures that are on that particular board appear to be looking at the amount of 
changes with capital expenditure, having to head into all these different places, um, along with the problem of one, well, a few nurse, fa fairly well-known cases in nursing home problems, that uh, it would be quite helpful so we could nail this thing about where Lothian actually is and how it feeds through into the figures um, that we're actually seeing ahead of us here uh, in, in terms of how they're comparing local with national, if you like. Um, Bob Doris. Thank you very much. Convener, I'm going to come and ask more about the change fund in a second, but uh, Ms Scanlon made a really telling contribution, I thought, in, earlier on when looking at uh, home care budgets for older people for 2011-12 and the, the lack of quality base baseline data uh, and the tension between allowing local flexibility in what they do and then having that, that, that national picture and understanding the bureaucracy that could be created around that. But Ms Gallagher gave one example, which I've got a very specific request, if you could come back on. She quite rightly pointed out the, the, the distinction between the spend in North Lanarkshire and the spend in Western Bartonshire, which was 12.6% of the budget for North Lanarkshire and 2% for, for, for Western Bartonshire. I understand North Lanarkshire for many years now has a, has a personalised budgets policy for older people which is a significant amount of spend, which may or may not be accounted for in care at home for older people, which may be very different from Western Bartonshire. I suggest that as one explanation, but that might be completely false, Mr Gray. Could we ask you maybe to come back um, to give us some more detailed information for that quite dramatic difference between those two uh, local authorities? Because that would start to get the committee to understand, get, get beneath the numbers. Is that, is that something you would be able to do? Ask these, um, uh, we can ask these partnerships to, to do that for us. Yeah. I think that, but in terms, so thank you, that was very helpful from Ms Scanlon. In terms of the, the change fund, uh, £300 million pounds over, over four years. Uh, at the last evidence session we took, uh, uh, I suggested that the, the strength of the change fund is some initiatives will be highly successful, some won't be, but the ones that are successful should be mainstreamed and the ones that aren't successful, obviously, should should be ditched. So mainstreamed and rolled out across other health board areas. Um, can you tell me how that will be monitored and audited uh, going forward? The mainstreaming of change fund initiatives and then rolling it out across health board areas. Yeah, I mean, the, the importance we attach to, to, to spreading these things and, and making them sustainable is evidenced by the fact that, that that's pretty much core to what the joint improvement team does. And, and Dr Henry will, will, will tell you a little about how we go about ensuring that these things happen. As part of our um, report um, in November, which was about sort of midway, that was looking at the midway point of the four-year change fund, we asked partnerships to self-assess themselves in terms of how much how far they had spread, where were, where were they at in terms of the spread of each of the specific areas of improvement or intervention that are part of the reshaping care pathway and that's provided as part of your, your pack. Now, it was a self-assessment, but it was a self-assessment that was done in partnership with a member of the joint improvement team who is walking that journey with the partnership. So there's an element of, of, of validity within that. And we are now working with partnerships to take that self-assessment and to turn that into an action plan going forward to complete the level of spread and, and mainstreaming of, of those good practices. So 14, 15 is the final year of mm -hmm. the change fund. Can we expect to see a, a, a when do we expect to see a kind of final overview report, overview report saying X percent of projects were not continued. That's fine. I've, I've put on the record saying that, that, that that's the whole point of the change fund. But why amount have now been mainstreamed and here's the strategy for rolling it out. When could we expect to see a, a report of that nature? I, I probably shouldn't give you a date to, to raise expectations on that, but I can give you a commitment that that is part of our core business. So we will be producing a further <coughs> report, at which is part of our kind of iterative process of, of national and local support. And that will be also complemented by our ongoing work to support partnerships to embed these 
approaches as part of their joint commissioning plan for older people? That will be really important for this committee or subsequent committees. We have to kind of, not, not just snapshot scrutiny, we have, to, we have to follow it through. Just just finally, in relation to health and social care integration, I'm just wondering if two parts to this, we're trying to brief as possible, I'm wondering in terms of once every 32 local authorities, apart from Highlands, will have this body corporate model for, for uh, older people, health and social care integration. Are we looking at a new set of baseline <coughs> figures for spend there for the first time? So that's a specific question. And the second one, if I give two local or, uh, organisations um, to get a flavour of how they would be impacted, so <coughs> something called the Good Morning Service in North Glasgow, £50,000 from the Change Fund. That's one organisation I hope could be mainstreamed following health and social care integration. But I've got another local project called the Alive and Kicking Project. It's about £130,000 from Glasgow City Council doing a lot of preventative spend work in the community around Red Road. Is that the kind of project we can expect to see the Health Board share the burden, the positive burden, for that preventative spend for older people going forward? And more importantly, can we start to audit that properly as a committee once we've got health and social care integration? I, I, I suppose, again, my reflection would be that very much resonates with the earlier conversation about the balance of local accountability versus national accountability, the proportionality of what we look at nationally versus what we look at locally, but get assurance that that local scrutiny is, um, is in place. Baseline budgets. I'm finished with the baseline budgets after the, the integrated resource framework mapping. All all health boards and councils have IRF data. Um, I might suggest that we bring in in fee from ASD if that's it's okay. Um, quite a lot of work in the report acknowledges this that a lot of work has gone in to understand local cost and activity, and to understand variation. So, um, and that's been done at a, a national aggregate level, a kind of more strategic level, but it's also been done locally at an aggregate level. And increasingly, we're seeing that also being done at an individual level and being able to look at sort of subpopulations around activity and spend. Um, so looking at different populations, such as people with dementia, but also looking at sub-geography levels, looking at GP practices and the way services are um, activity and costs associated with those services. So there is a lot of work to try and understand activity and cost going into integration. It, 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 sorry, Mr Gray, sorry. Yeah, you want to know if they'll have budgets and whether they'll be baselined. Is that, is that the question? When these budgets emerge, uh, I'm keen, convener, to know that when we look at North Lanarkshire and Western Bartonshire, we're comparing apples with apples, so sure. we can see... Obviously, you wouldn't compare Western Bartonshire with the Highlands because there's very, very different demographies there, but you probably could compare reasonably North Lanarkshire with Western Bartonshire once these budgets are, are created. Will, will we have the data to compare baselines with each other? Whereas we can't do that just now. I would expect that... So I would expect they'll have baseline budgets. I think I take your point, Mr. Doris, about comparability. Will you know? Will, will, will it be the same? And that's something I'll follow up. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Just before I bring James Donnelly, can I get some clarification on on definitions um, when we talk about mainstreaming? Um, are you talking about taking successful projects and having them integrated into the mainstream activity of both? local authorities and health. Um, and are you also talking about taking the amount that is available under the change fund just now and still making sure that that additional money is available, but it's not available for specific projects that will be given to the relevant agencies to determine how best they deliver their services? So are we going to see a continuation of the money mainstreamed into the budgets um, or are we going to see the money withdrawn and the services absorbed into uh, the, the activities? The change fund is limited, convener, so in other words it's for a period of time and it's not being continued, just an explicit answer to your question. There so, so there will be no mainstream, there will be no financial mainstreaming, uh, the services will be mainstreamed and absorbed but the financial responsibility will then fall to the health service, local health service, and to the local authority. 
it will. There was an innovation fund which replaces it, but you, I mean, I don't in any way want to mislead the committee. The, the change fund is time limited. The principle behind a change fund is that it, it, it funds the change, and once the change has been embedded, then it's it should be displacing other things that weren't as good. That's that's the you know that's the point about it. And uh, therefore, that, that's the way it, it operates. No, no, I, I, yeah. I, I understand that, and I think it is important to get that clarification because I remember uh, much of the debate about the entering fencing of local <coughs> authority funding and the mainstreaming of uh, some of that ring fence funding. What happened was that funding was put into the local authority budgets for the local authorities yeah. to decide how best to deliver the mm. services. What we are talking about here is actually the disappearance of that fund. So it's not as if it's going to be absorbed into any future increase. It will, as you said, disappear. It's time yeah, limited. That's fine. OK, sorry, James Dorn. Thanks very much, Convener. Can, can I just very briefly go back to a point that uh, Ken McIntosh raised? Ray? He was talking about the comments of Ranald Mayer. What I remember about Ranald Mayer's comments was that he said that reshaping care and other... Uh, it matters. We're not about giving us the ability to close hospitals, but this new way of working was about making sure that we didn't have to build any more. Would that ring a bell with you? I mean, the, the likes of your example, Dr Henry, which would sort of like freeze up and, and, and brings the care out into the community as opposed to being in hospitals, would, 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 you, would you think that was a more accurate summary than the fact that we brought this in hoping that we'd be able to close some hospitals? I accept that some buildings are now going to be used for other things or may not be used at all. I think, I think it's reasonable. I mean, I think the, 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 the fact is that there are some facilities being, being, being reused for other purposes. And uh, I mean, there's, there's obviously the, the uh, major project in Glasgow to build the, the new hospital, which will result in other facilities um, being released and replaced. Uh, and I'm just somewhat reluctant uh, Mr Doran and Mr McIntosh to say what will be happening in 10 years' time. Uh, that, that's, uh, that, hence, my, hence my hesitance. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. I just really just wanted to clarify what I thought Mr Mayor had said. Uh, I'd like to ask a couple of questions around uh, the sharing, identifying and sharing good practice and the role the Scottish Government and Joint Improvement Team have on it. The, it's already been talked, discussed a wee bit today, but does it, would this include, for example, the best practice would, would this include trying to explain why there's a different percentage of spend in the, the different areas across the country? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, one of the um, big drivers for spend is um, the rates of admission and the lengths of stay in acute care. So that, that is, um, as we know from the integrated resource framework, the, the biggest proportion of this, the health and social care budget spend in older people is on in-hospital care and particularly care as a result of an emergency admission. So we are working with partnerships. We're very focused on the emergency bed day target. And, you know, we, we know the, pu the published data does show that the over 75 emergency bed days in Scotland have fallen by a total of 359. So 359 fewer occupied beds today than there were at the beginning of this um, 09010 baseline. So that's, that's, that's a very real shift. And what we recognise is that un until and unless we can make some difference in that emergency bed day rate, we won't be able to reinvest the resources associated with that into more anticipatory, preventative and, and care and support at home. So that's very much a focus of the work that we're doing with partnerships. That's the, the, the statistic for over 75s. If you look at over 65s, it's 491 fewer over 65s in hospital um, at April 13, which is the last published national data for that statistic, than there were when this process baselined in 0809. That's very tangible. Okay, and one of the other benefits, hopefully, of, of this joint working, would it, would it allow a, a kind of uniformity of the categorisations that we were talking about earlier on? 
I mean, again, I, I take into consideration the, the, the local flexibility that you were mm -hmm. talking about, but obviously for auditing purposes, yeah. the more things are categorised yeah. as one. It, you know. it, it is a very real challenge and one that we're working with analytical services division and information services division on how we actually code and classify some of this activity because the models are changing and some of our coding and, and data has to change to keep pace with that. So, for example, if you look at hospital at home services, specialist services that are now delivering care that was previously delivered in hospital but delivering it in the community in people's own homes, there's not an easy diagnostic coding for that activity so it's easy for that to be invisible so we're actively working with ISD and how we might code and capture that data so that we can track the, gro <coughs> the you know the, the growth and spread of that across Scotland that would include the lights of the recording the different types of home care and stuff like yes, that would it also um, include yes. the the third sector uh, like earlier on when Mr Power was was, was a trying to make a contribution. Uh, we talked about it not really being germane to the support, but you're right in terms of uh, uh, kind of explain why numbers might have dropped if there's another service that can be used. Now, would, would we have some means of being able to see how many people are using that type of service as opposed to the most statutory one? Well, if, if I've understood it right this time in terms of the, the, the right, general third sector, um, Certainly, there has been a significant um, involvement of the, the third sector, both in terms of the planning and delivery of services. As I, I said before, there has been significant input from third sector organisations across the board for decades, centuries. But the, the, the issue around the, um, the change fund is what we've seen and what has been um, mentioned within the um, Audit Commission report was that the third sector certainly feel that they have much more of a, an influence in, in how services are being designed and delivered. And I think um, certainly if you look at the individual projects that have been funded through the Change Fund, there is a, a lot of evidence, a lot of, of um, data, if you like, about the numbers of individuals that, um, that those services are actually being delivered to. And it, it is a difference in the way of working. It's not simply about replacing um, a statutory service with a non-statutory service. It's about a way of actually starting to connect communities together, to actually signpost individuals towards different ways of actually uh, using services. It's linked into self-directed support. It's a fundamental shift in the way we're actually providing services and the way we're thinking about services to actually empower individuals to actually support families, to support communities, to actually support themselves better rather than simply rely on such statutory services. But there certainly are figures within each of the partnerships which demonstrate how each of those individually funded projects that have come from the Change Fund for third sector organisations have actually um, engaged individuals, have supported individuals, and those figures will be available through individual partnerships. Two very brief points on that. First of all, one to yourself, Dr. Henry. Further to uh, Bob Doris's comments, then, would that sort of thing be something that would come back to the audit committee in some form or another? You know, what, what's been done with the third sector? How do you use the change fund, and what carried on from the change fund to here? Sure, we, we we welcome the opportunity to to bring that back at a future date. Right, that's great. And and the the last point I'd like to well, the last question I'd like to ask is. Do you think that what you've just said to me there about how the third sector seem to are bringing a kind of new and innovative way of doing things, and, and the shared practice that we're talking about is that? Can you see then that, it's, that the third sector could be the ones who are teaching others about the best way to do this, and, and hopefully that will come out of this, the reshaping care for older people? Absolutely, and I think it has not just changed the way in terms of how the third sector have been involved, but it's starting to reshape the way that our workforce development is taking place. And certainly through the, the whole integration agenda, the workforce development is very much focused on how we work in a co-productive way in partnership between the statutory sector, the user of the service, and indeed the, the third sector uh, providers as well. So I think it is starting to reshape the way that statutory services think as well, and they can learn a lot from the third sector. That's good. Sorry, can I ask just one very brief one? Uh, when we get the health and social care, body into being, can you still see the third sector having a meaningful role in that and can we be assured that, that they'll be a part of the decision making? I think what I've tried to make clear certainly when I've been engaging with partnerships is I um, 
they're probably sick of hearing it, but I refer them to the policy memorandum. I can't quote the, the, the paragraphs, but it's very clear from the policy memorandum for the, the Public Bodies Joint Working Act that there is an expectation that we don't lose the gains that we have made through reshaping care for older people as far as the third sector involvement is concerned, and we have to ensure that that's embedded in, in the integration agenda. They may not be seen as part of the, um, the, 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 the formal sort of melding of health and social care, but it's very clear that the intent of the legislation is that the third and independent sectors are fully part of the decision-making process and indeed the design and delivery process as well. And that's something that I continually bang the drum with. And I think when the, uh, the statutory um, uh, uh, regulations come out, it will make it very clear to statutory organisations what the expectations are as far as involvement with the third sector. That's great. Thanks very much. Yeah. Just a very brief uh, follow-up to the very points Mr Power raised. Um, you said that there's evidence that the voluntary and third sector are um, playing an increasingly important role in this. Uh, Annie Gunner Logan gave evidence um, at our <coughs> session, just highlighted the fact that uh, the, they are no longer, they are not a statutory partner, a part of the Joint Futures Bill has gone through, they are not a statutory partner uh, under those plans. And in paragraph 62 in the Auditor General's report, uh, the Auditor General specifically highlighted that the GIT, the Joint Improvement Task Force itself, reviewed NHS Board and Council's work with communities and concluded that it is very difficult to measure any impact that these initiatives have had. And that's clearly quite worrying for us because I think most of the MSPs, I would imagine, on this table are, are very keen to promote um, community-based initiatives and recognise the strength and the resilience they build in communities. But if we can't actually audit it, if we can't follow the audit trail, it's actually very difficult to give it a political priority. So I'm just wondering if, if you have evidence that actually supports their impact. The Auditor General wasn't able to highlight it, and I think it would be very useful for us. If I may, um, it is, it's complex. Um, I think we heard that one earlier. It's, it's <laughs> probably the word I would use in that there's not a linear relationship between the input from a community or voluntary sector support and the outcome. So we are working with Evaluation Scotland and the Stitch in Time project to look at contribution analysis and logic modelling to map the impact of these um, interventions. It's, it's not that it's... It, it is difficult, but it's difficult mm. because it is a complex, multidimensional um, intervention rather than it's, it, it's, it's difficult because of... of, of of just gathering data. And I, I tell you, I just mentioned that the classic example would be a lunch club, which costs very, Indeed. very little to the local authority, ends up being cut as part of a budget saving, when actually it is part of, it, it is really a, an incredibly important investment and mm -hmm. has in, uh, creates strength in the community that we're actually missing. So I would just, mm -hmm. I would just say, if you have any evidence, please bring it to the committee. Mr. Kirk, can I come back um, to what you were saying about your discussions um, with with other providers? I think everything that we've heard, both today and at the previous evidence session, would suggest that <clears throat> in order to make sure that people aren't inappropriately either placed in acute services or kept there longer than they needed, there needs to be um, appropriate and flexible care uh, wherever they need it, whether it's in their own home or you know some other kind of community support facility such as the one just described by Ken McIntosh. And a lot of the discussion centres around the home care service delivered by the local authority or the third sector or about some of the specialist services that, 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 that are there, the individual um, services provided to people. But often the key thing about keeping people in the community is making sure that they have access to a well-designed and relevant home. Which means that sometimes the, the particular house that they're in is maybe not the best one for them to stay in the community. They need to move in to as I've seen and I'm sure others have seen um, some of the, the fantastic 
uh, new housing being provided, sometimes by local authorities, but more often than not by housing associations. Some of it will be mainstream housing, but just better built and better designed. But often it will be sheltered housing and very sheltered housing. And if we look at the demographics of, of what we've been discussing, that huge increase in older people, it means that, yes, we can adapt some of the, the, the existing homes to their, their needs. And I'm sure every one of us is, have dealt with relatives where we've had to get local authority adaptations. But, you know, as Ken McIntosh was saying about lunch clubs, the local authority budgets are under pressure, so the adaptations budgets are often um, squeezed to say the least can't keep up with the demand. But that also will be limited. And what we need is now more new build, sheltered and very sheltered housing. What discussions are taking place about increasing the provision of sheltered and very sheltered housing as part of this whole policy planning? And given that we're now talking about shifting resources away from acute into preventative and into <coughs> community, how much of an increase can we expect to see in the budgets for constructing sheltered and very sheltered housing in the next five to ten years? I don't think I'm the best person to answer that question. That's not um, something that um, I have an immediate, an immediate answer to in terms of what can we expect in terms of um, investment in that. So, Mr Gray? There's a, a housing coordinating group. Um, I, I think, I, convenient, I think you'll... I hope you will accept that I will not be drawn on, on what ministers might decide about future housing budgets, but I take your point about the um, importance of properly either adapted or newly built accommodation to uh, ensure that people... Leaving aside the, the political debates about what this administration or future administrations might spend on housing, surely if you're talking about reshaping the use of your current budgets into making sure that people are able to stay at home, then part of that discussion has, yes, got to be individual home care support, um, specialist services, aids and adaptations, but it also would mean the provision of suitable housing. And does that not then feature in how you take some of your budget to make sure that that housing is provided so that people are not kept in hospital? Well, it, it certainly features in the, in, in, in the discussions we have. I think, I mean, you, you know, I've made, made the point about not preempting future decisions of, of this sort of future government. But okay, um, well, what about the current then? Can you tell us that for the, you know, the current in the past few years, how much additional have you put in to sheltered and very sheltered housing as part of your discussions? about reshaping services for older people? Well, as far as I know, Mr Henry, the, the health budget has not funded housing. I, I mean, if, if that's what you're asking me. Well, it's partly that, because I know that there is a separate housing budget. Yeah. But if you're talking about using your budget to make sure that people are not hospitalised unnecessarily, or once they're in, are allowed to be back out into the community, we've heard today from a number uh, of contributions about integration. Where is the integration then about the need to identify and provide more sheltered and very sheltered housing so that people are able to be supported in their own homes um, at a time of need? So, well, th 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 there isn't currently capital expenditure coming out of health for housing. That, that is... You know, that would be an accurate but, answer. Get, well, I presume integration is not just integration between local authorities yeah. and health service. Integration is also between, within the Scottish Government, health and housing. So what discussions have there been in terms of your integrated social policy planning to provide more financial support for the construction 
of sheltered and very sheltered housing, which is absolutely fundamental to keeping people in the community. Well, I mean, Dr Henry can tell you a little more about what is discussed at the Housing Coordinating Group. That may be a starting point. Our housing partners are key partners in the reshaping care work, both at a strategic level at the housing coordinating group nationally that has you know, the, the housing and health leads um, working together, and at a local level where I would, I would um, say that all partnerships have housing involved in the reshaping care discussions around the change plan and the joint commissioning plan. Housing is wired into the joint commissioning work and we also are supporting, working very closely with CIH and with SFHA around sort of housing learning network, housing innovation. In fact, next week there are two events, one in Edinburgh, one in Inverness, with our housing partners, including RSLs, to look at how, how we can maximise their contribution. And obviously the Residential Care Task Force has been a, a, a key... Um, <coughs> building block in our work with housing partners. Yes, but if we're talking about doubling the budgets for home care, then surely we're not talking about doubling the budgets to keep people in inadequate homes that are expensive to adapt. We would also need, as part of that process, to provide new <laughs> housing that is especially suited to the needs of that older population, either the sheltered or the very sheltered housing. Now, where is, as part of this process that you're looking at reshaping the services for older people, where is the discussion and how much about the provision of capital resources to provide that increased need and demand for relevant uh, housing. Sorry, Gillian, did you have? I can't answer on the budgets for RSLs because that's obviously a separate um, budget stream. I can say that we have been working very closely with those existing RSLs who have a combination of care homes and very sheltered housings about future development. And I know that some change fund, in fact, a number of very successful change fund um, projects have been around providing more social care within the housing that, that already exists. But I know that you're asking, how do we get more into the future? Um, I think we have a dialogue with the banking sector in terms of the independent um, sector provision of uh, housing. And there are a number of models, quite exciting models, coming up um, in terms of care villages and, and supported uh, housing. But we don't have the... Uh, we don't hold the purse strings. No, we can I, only encourage yeah, that type no, of No, I understand that, and it's good that that discussion is taking place with the banks, financial providers, and so on. But also there is a government budget for housing. And if we're talking about integration, and if we're talking about coordination, then where can you point me to that will show the coordination of discussions and planning for the provision of more sheltered and very sheltered housing and where can you point me to to the decisions that are being taken about shaping resources whether it's from health or housing or others into providing more money um, for that because otherwise what you start to do is you start to put more money as you're planning to do of a of a very under pressure budget into keeping people often in houses that are expensive to adapt and maybe not best suited for their needs. I so mean, who's, who's doing that? Who's taking that decision? Well, ministers take the decision about where the budgets lie. Yes, where the budgets lie, but also, surely, you've, talk, you've talked about integration, you've talked about coordination, you've talked about planning. So at the coordination planning and policy level, or leaving, sorry, leaving the ministers aside, what, where does housing fit in to your discussions about reshaping <laughs> services for older people? Well, the, the housing coordinating group has been mentioned. There's the, we have housing innovation learning events, <coughs> and what we're seeking to do is to ensure that when, when private providers or indeed local authorities are building, making new provision, that it conforms to the, 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 the highest standard, our um, planning and building control 
uh, regulations are also aimed at ensuring that houses are, don't have to be adapted once they're built in order to accommodate older people. So that's the, that, that, that's the direction of travel. But, I mean, convener, I understand the question you're asking me, and the best answer I can give is that I can't preempt ministers' decisions about where future budgets okay. should lie. OK, I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you very much. Um, it's been a very full discussion today. Um, we look forward to getting some of the additional information that you've offered uh, to provide, and, and clearly this is going to be um, a major... <coughs> issue, uh, not just for this Parliament, but for future Parliaments. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. Um, with that, we will move to item three in the agenda. We'll move into private session.